Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much. It's so good to see you and all of y'all coming on in from the, from the lobby, getting your coffee and donuts. It's great to be here together. Uh, my name is Tim Beard. I'm one of the pastors here at Dunwoody Community Church. So happy to see everybody. Have a great morning. Uh, plan to be together as we worship God. I um, want to let you know of a couple things that are going on. First, if you're new here, if you're, it's your first time, second time, and we just don't know that you're here, if you've been here for a while, you've been hiding out, if you could look in the row in front of you, grab one of those guest cards, one of those connect cards, uh, fill it out, give us your name, uh, email address, phone number, and you can drop it in one of the offering boxes on your way out today. I um, want to let you know about what's coming up in Christmas time, because Christmas time is right around the corner. Anybody have their Christmas trees up already? Raise your hands, Natalie. Give your, <laughs> how, how many do you have up? A lot. A lot. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? All right. We got Christmas trees going on here. Uh, ours is going up here before Thanksgiving. We're excited about that. Well, as a church, uh, we look at this Christmas season as a great opportunity to reach out to our friends and neighbors, all our friends and neighbors who maybe aren't plugged into a church or maybe don't know Jesus yet. We want to use this season as an opportunity to bring the light of Jesus in their lives because the greatest gift that we can give our friends and neighbors and relatives is the gift of the gospel. And we want to help you with that. So we have a few things coming up. Um, first of all, for our church family on Saturday, December the 4th at nine o'clock, as many of you as possible, if you can make it here to help us decorate the church, come in for about three hours. We'll have coffee, we'll have snacks and all that kind of stuff. We'll get the church all decorated for the, for the Christmas season. The more people we have, the quicker we can be done with the whole thing. So that's kind of an internal Christmas party. Uh, we're also having a special night of Christmas music on the 12th of December. And we're doing this not just for us to come together and, you know, sing songs and enjoy ourselves, but this is being geared as a great opportunity to invite your neighbors, the people in your cul-de-sac, your co co-workers, people you go to school with. Um, it'll be a really fun night together of some great musicians coming together and just, uh, you know, we're not going to like lock the doors and, and, and tell everybody, here's why we really invited you to this place. We're going to just love on people. Uh, I'm going to be asking some people here the next couple of weeks to volunteer to help out with different things like we want to do baked cookies and all that kind of stuff. We're basically throwing a Christmas party and inviting our friends because we want to give you, all of us, as many opportunities as we can to reach out, especially in this season when everything points to Jesus, to reach out to, to our unchurched friends. So heads up on that. Go ahead and mark your calendars and be praying about who you want to invite. You know, this is not, this is a great opportunity. People love coming to events like this, especially since nothing happened last year. Remember last year, our Christmas Eve services, we had to have four of them um, because we could cap it of like 30 people or something crazy like that. Well, good news, we're having one big Christmas Eve service this year. So uh, look forward to that. Let's see, the other thing I want to let you know about is um, this is a family matter. So if you're watching the video later, you're not going to see this portion on it. Um, so this cut right now. Now we resume our regularly scheduled programming. And I hope that in the video, I say, hey, we have a super secret thing. We're just going to tell our church family. And then everybody's like, I wonder what they talked about. But that's just me. Um, okay, so I'm going to ask Larry Heron, one of our elders, to come up. And as he's coming up, just want to remind you that although we don't pass the plate. We do depend on your offerings to support the church. We believe that giving is an act of worship. Uh, it should be our first fruits. It shows that we believe that God owns everything and that we are trusting him as we sacrificially give. So especially as we go into our, or we're in our fourth quarter, uh, if you could be praying about how you can contribute to our ministry needs here at DCC, we appreciate it. Thank you. Larry? Thank you, Tim. Good morning, everybody. I'm glad to let you know that we have um, three elders that are we're in the process of adding to the elder board. We've gone through all the interviews and that sort of thing. And uh, they are Eric Svensson and uh, Terrell Davis and Tim Beard. And uh, from this point on, we have three weeks, three Sundays, three weeks that uh, if you have any concerns or questions about them, and don't bring up the accordion. We've, we've, we've talked about that. So, <laughs> But if you do, uh, please contact uh, one of the elders uh, that are currently serving. 
and uh, we're just continuing to pray that for God's leading and, and blessing. Let me pray for us this morning. Gracious God, we are so thankful for your goodness, your kindness, your mercy to us. We thank you for choosing to use us to accomplish your will on this planet. We thank you for your presence among us, that you choose to dwell with us. And especially as we move towards the Christmas season, Emmanuel, God with us, we are grateful that you're the kind of God that pursues us. And so help us to pursue you this morning in worship. I pray that the songs from our lips and the thoughts from our heart will make you glad. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you could stand up as we begin this worship time. How many of you are rejoicing in the house of the Lord this morning? And if you are not yet, you are about to be. So let's get started with this worship time. How we sing? Rejoice in the Lord always. Then again I say, again I say, rejoice in the Lord always.
call my name I'm so glad he changed me Darkness held me down But Jesus pulled me out I'm no longer bound I'm so glad he saved me See I Now a new creation in Christ The old has gone there in life And I live by faith, not my soul There is a new name written down in glory It is mine, yes it's mine And I met the author of my story the victory see it's all over me and i'm so glad he changed me see i'm now a new creation in christ the old has gone this life and i live by faith not by Oh, Jesus is mine. Jesus is mine. Oh, 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 Jesus
together. Lord, you are good to us. Lord, thank you that you don't give us what we deserve. That, Lord, as we look in the rearview mirror of our lives, we see that even in troubling times and difficult times and difficult circumstances, that uh, you cause good to come out of that, God. And thank you that uh, we know the end of the story, that although in this life we struggle, we have difficulties, we have hurts and pains, uh, we know that the end of the story, God, and we know that one day we will be with you. You will wipe away every tear from our eyes, and we will worship you and glorify you forever. Lord, so that's what we're here to do this morning, to, to do that now, that eternity starts right now, God. So I pray for our time. I pray for Pastor Jeff as he comes up and he delivers the message that you have put in his heart, Lord. The Holy Spirit, you would speak through him, that you would give us ears to hear. God, I believe that you have a word for each one of us today. I don't know what that is, but you speak to each one of us individually. So we pray that you would speak to us, Holy Spirit, through your servant Jeff this morning. And we offer ourselves to you, our hearts, our minds, our souls, our intellects, everything about us to you and for your purposes. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Amen. And when you've had a seat, pull out your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians 16. There are only 16 chapters in Corinthians. So a journey that we began on January 2nd of the beginning of this year, we're going to finish up today. Uh, we took a couple breaks in there. You know, we took a break during the Easter time for Lent and Easter. We took a break in August and September to talk about the, the seven marks of a disciple. But other than that, we've just been moving our way through Corinthians. And we are going to finish talking about something that, you know, after all the different things we've talked about in Corinthians about, well, what does this mean? And what's he talking here? And how does this relate? Talk about something that is completely relatable to everyone, money. That's where Paul ends the letter to 1 Corinthians, talking about giving. So read along with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. We're going to read the entire chapter. Now, about the collection for the Lord's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up, so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Then when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable for me to go also, they will accompany me. After I go through Macedonia, I will come to you, for I will be going through Macedonia. Perhaps I'll even stay with you for a while or spend the winter so that you can help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now and only make a passing trip. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. But I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost. Because a great door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many who oppose me. When Timothy comes, see to it that he has nothing to fear while he's with you, for he's carrying on the work of the Lord just as I am. No one then should treat him with contempt. Send him on his way in peace so that he may return to me. I am expecting him along with the brothers. Now about our brother Apollos. I strongly urged him to go to you with the brothers. He was quite unwilling to go now, but he will go when he has the opportunity. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, do everything in love. You know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, and they have devoted themselves to the service of the Lord's people. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to submit to such people and to everyone who joins in the work and labors at it. I was glad when Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaius arrived, because they have supplied what was lacking from you. They have refreshed my spirit and yours also. Such men deserve recognition. The churches in the province of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord, as does the church that meets in their house. All the brothers and sisters here send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. If anyone does not love the Lord, let that person be cursed. Come, Lord. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love to all of you in Christ Jesus. Amen. So in my Bible, if you've got a Bible that does subheadings, it labels the first four verses, the collection for the Lord's people. And then after that, it's personal requests and final greetings. And Paul actually layers throughout this passage things about giving, things about being involved in God's work. So we're going to sort of walk our way through it and talk about some of these. This section, beginning in verse 1, starts with a phrase I hope you recognize by now, now about, dot, dot, dot. 
And you've heard me say this dozens of times, and today's the last time you have to hear me say it. Um, Paul's letter is a response. The Corinthians wrote him a letter. They sent some people. We have their names finally now. We know the guys who brought the letter, Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaius. They brought the letter. They brought information. They came to Paul. They, here's the letter with these questions that the church had for Paul. Here's information about it. And Paul's answering them. And we get finally to the last question. I don't know if it's the last question they asked or he just saved it for last. Now about the collection for the Lord's people. They're asking about giving. They're asking about giving money for other Christians, for other things going on in the world. And we don't actually know the question. You know, there's times we said, like back in verse 35 of chapter 15, someone will ask, how are the dead raised? There's times he actually tells us what the question they asked him was. He doesn't tell us this time. He just gives us the topic about the collection for the Lord's people. But there's some clues in the text that tell us what's going on. So we know from Acts 18, you can go back and look at Acts chapter 18, it's the chapter about Paul founding this church. It's when he was on his second missionary journey, he came to the city of Corinth, he started the church. And we know from there that Paul first went to the synagogue, which he was Jewish, that's pretty much always what he did, and he talked with people and he reasoned with people and he tried tried and get people to believe that Jesus was the Christ, tried to get, get Jews to believe that Jesus was the Christ. Eventually, as always happened, they got sick of him and kicked him out. We don't know if that's you know a week, three weeks, a month, six months, but at some point, they're like, okay, enough already, be gone with you. And then he goes out into the Greek world and he starts preaching in the, the places where people in Greek cities would come and discuss things and talk about things, the, the Agora, the Acropolis, places like that. And he starts preaching to the non-Jews, and trying to get them to believe in Jesus. And we know from this chapter in Acts that there are Jews and Greeks both in the church. And that's pretty much true of almost every church outside of Israel itself. They're all a mixture of Jews who have believed that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah and non-Jews, Greeks, who have believed that Jesus is the God come to earth to save them. And Greeks and Jews have totally different views on giving. Like they have completely opposite, diametrically opposed views on how you give money in your religion. For a Jew, they follow, we call it the Old Testament. I mean, they just called it the Bible. They follow the teachings in the Bible, which is, you've probably heard of it, the tithe. Tithe just means a tenth. In the Old Testament, giving is prescribed. What you give is exactly listed. You give this much, you give to these things, you give at this time. Everything for a Jew about giving was exactly set out in the law. You have to give 10%. If you're a farmer, that means 10% of the crops that come in that year. If you're a herder, that means 10% of the animals that were given that year. You have to give the best 10%. You know, you have a 100 sheep born that year. You owe God 10. You can't go through and be like, oh, well, that one's about to die. I'm going to give that one. You have to go through your 100 and pick out the 10 best. Those go to God. God gets it off the top. He gets his part first. You don't harvest if you're a farmer. Harvest lasts like four plus months because there's a grain harvest and a wheat harvest and a barley harvest and a grape harvest. And you don't do all your harvesting, get to the end, count it all up and say, okay, here's 10% and give it to God. You harvest for a week And then you give all that to God, all of it. Now that's probably not even gonna be 10% if you're harvesting for four months, but God gets first. If something happens later in the year that some of your harvest is wrecked, God gets his first. He gets it before the king gets his harvest. He gets the best. He gets it first. And the scriptures tell you exactly where to give it. You give to the temple in Jerusalem. You give to the Levites in your local region for benevolence. You keep 10% at some point to offset your your expenses when you go to Jerusalem. It it tells you exactly what to save, what to give, where to give it. It is 100% prescribed. If you're Jewish, you know exactly what you're supposed to be giving. If you're Greek, there are no rules. There are absolutely no rules about giving in the Greek religions. If you worship Zeus or Apollo or you're in one of the Greek mystery religions and you worship Mithras or one of those guys, you give whatever you want. You don't have to give anything, ever. It is totally up to you which gods you worship because gosh, there's zillions of them. It's totally up to you when you give something. It's totally up to you how much you give. It is entirely your choice. 
And so it looks like from some of the language that that's one of the issues going on in this church. You would have Jewish Christians saying, look, it's in the Bible. We know how to give. You give 10%, you give it here, you give it here, you give it at this point in time, you give it to these people, this is what it's for. It's prescribed. And you would have Greeks in the same church saying, no, you don't. That's not, that's not giving. If it's prescribed, it's not a gift. It's an obligation. You, you, you give whatever you want, whenever you want. It looks like there's some tension in the church over what you give and how much you give and where you give. And like I said, I mean, that's a tension we still feel today. And Paul says a couple really interesting things. One of the reasons we think this is the issue is what he says in verse one and two, that word collection. Now about the collection for the Lord's people, at the end of verse two, when I come, no collections will have to be made. That's the only time in the whole Bible that word is ever used. Paul talks about giving all the time, but he calls it a grace. He calls it a service. He calls it an offering. He calls it a contribution. It's the only time he ever uses this word, and it's the Greek word. It's the word for voluntary contribution. Paul says right at the start, this is not one of those, you must give 10%. This time, this way, these people. He, I think very intentionally, because it's the only time he ever uses this word in all of his writings that we have. He uses the word for a voluntary contribution. Now at this point, you know, you'd think between the two of them, the Greeks are probably going, woohoo, yeah, we were right and you were wrong. Whoa, okay. And then look at what he says, the very next phrase. It's not even the next sentence, it's the next phrase. Do... What I told the Galatian churches to do, that do, it's a command. This isn't a suggestion. Paul's not saying, here's some ideas about how to give. Paul says, do it. When it says, I told the Galatians, the word means commanded, prescribed. Like if literally what Paul says is, what I commanded the Galatians churches, you do that. The the do is emphatic. So he just said it's a voluntary contribution. And then he told you, here's how to do it. Because you will do it. You know, in our world, we have these sort of similar tensions. In my subdivision several years ago, the pool broke. I think it got a crack in it. Something happened. I don't understand it, but it was bad. So all the water has to be taken out. Repairs have to be made. All the water has to be put back in. Apparently the fire department has to come to fill up your pool. Who knew these things? It was expensive. So I got an assessment. I got a nice letter from the homeowners association saying, hey, you're in the swim and tennis club. You owe us $500. Every household owes us $500. You have to give. When I joined the swim and tennis club, that was part of the deal. If there's expenses that can't be paid by the normal regular dues, you will pay them. We'll just split them up across the households. That's the Jewish way. It's required. You will pay $500. You will pay it to this person. You'll pay it for this reason. You will pay it by this time. On the other hand, several years ago in my subdivision, a UPS truck backed up into the sign in our main entrance crushed the sign and damaged the sort of, you know, stone island in the middle of the road that it was in. So UPS very kindly gave us money to fix the sign. But the Homeowners Association sent out a letter and they said, you know, we've got to buy a new sign, but our signs are kind of old, which is true because I remember that sign from moving to that subdivision in 1976. So I don't know how old it was, but it was definitely there in 76. Like we're going to modernize our sign a little bit. But UPS isn't paying. There's four entrances to my subdivision and there's a swim and tennis club. They all have signage on them. UPS isn't paying for the other three entrances. They're not paying for the the, the swim and tennis club. Would you consider donating something, they said, so we can get new signs, right? It's not a command. They can't order me. They can't make me. I haven't signed anything that says I pay for new signs. They're asking for a contribution. That's the Greek way of doing things. You get a contribution. If you want to do it, great, do it. If you want new signs, pay for new signs. If you don't, don't. If you want Poseidon's help, give him an offering. If you don't, don't. If you want Apollo's help, give him something. We have these things in our world. And Paul says right at the outset, no, it's a voluntary contribution. And here's how you got to do it. (laughs) See, neither of those examples about the subdivision, neither of them work. 
Because Paul's saying it's not the Greek way, it's not the Jewish way. It's not all free, it's not all prescribed. It's not a ton of rules, but it's not no rules either. Giving for a Christian, for a follower of Christ, is absolutely commanded. If you are a follower of Christ, you are commanded to give to support the work of the Lord's people to support ministry, to support what God is doing. Notice these guys, this is going to Jerusalem. We'll talk about that in a minute. They're not, it's not even for them. It's for someone else. If you are a Christian, giving is commanded, but it is voluntary. It's not commanded how much you give. It's not commanded who you give it to. It's not commanded when you give or where you give or why you give. All of that is left up to you as God's follower. You absolutely must give but the rest is left up to you. So Paul tells us, like he commands them. Again, what I commanded the Galatian churches to do, I'm commanding you to do. Here's how to give, because you must give. But notice, it's not percentages. It's not this much to this person or anything else. How does Paul say we should be giving? The first thing he says is we should be giving regularly on the first day of every week. Each of you set aside a sum of money, saving it up. As Christians, Paul says, we should be giving regularly. It should be happening on some sort of regular schedule. I think a week works well for these people with their lives. Maybe it's different for you depending on how you get paid, everything else. But you gotta do it because let's face it, what happens if you don't set money aside? You spend it. That's what money is for. It's for spending. If you do not put it aside then your needs will expand to fit whatever money you have. And there are so many examples of guys making $10 million a year and living hand to mouth and deeply in debt because of their needs. They need the boat. They need the plane. They need the four vacations to the Caribbean. They need the six houses. Their needs have expanded to fill their income. And Paul says, look, Every week, put it aside. See, this offering is going to Jerusalem. He doesn't say why here, but we know from the book of Acts, there's a famine in Israel right now. This money is going for famine relief for the Christians who live back in Jerusalem and in Israel. And Paul says, you need to put it aside every week. They can't send it to Jerusalem every week. He even says it. They're gonna send it all together at some point in the future. But if you don't set it aside regularly, Then he says, then when I come, we're gonna have to take a collection. I'm gonna have to ask you about it. We're gonna have to twist arms. There's gonna be guilt. It's like, we don't need to do any of that, folks. Every week, take a little and set it aside. Put it where you won't spend it. Keep it safe until it's time to give. Paul says the first thing you need to do, again, giving is commanded, not the how much, not the to who, et cetera, but giving is commanded. Paul says do it regularly. The second thing he says is do it proportionally. Set aside a sum of money, and we translate it in keeping with your income, because that makes sense to us. We have incomes. Nobody in this world had anything like a steady income. Right? You had what came in. If you were a farmer, you had what grew and you sold that year. It was different every year. If you were a shepherd, you had whatever was born and that's different every year. If you, even if you're a businessman, and many of you are businessmen, you don't know how much you're gonna buy and sell that year at the beginning of the year. No one has what we have today, like salaries. You live on what you live on and what comes in. What Paul literally says is that you should set aside a sum however you are being prospered. And I really like that. I like that for two reasons. First, I like that it's passive. It's not however you are prospering. It's how you are being prospered. Because as believers, we all acknowledge, or we should acknowledge, we should at least give lip service to the fact that none of us have wealth because we're so smart or we're so clever or we're so incredible. Now don't get me wrong, you all are smart, clever, and incredible, right? I'm not saying anything about that. I'm saying I'm not smart, clever, or incredible. We don't live based on how strong we are and how smart we are and what we do. We earn and we live because the Lord is gracious to us. And you will read that throughout the scriptures. 
The, the reason we are strong is God has given us strength. The reason we have clever minds is God has given them to us. The reason we can earn anything is because God is gracious to us. And he is gracious to everyone. He is gracious to us who love him. And he is gracious to people who hate him. Because he is a kind and a generous God. But we have what we have because God has prospered us. And so Paul doesn't say give as you are prospering. He says give as you are being prospered. How is God prospering you? How is God making your life advance? What is God doing for you? Paul says, okay, that's how you should be giving. And I like that it's present. He doesn't say how you were prospered. He doesn't say, okay, look back and say to yourself, oh yeah, that's been a really good year. I have a bunch of extra now. I'll give some of that. He says, as you are being prospered. Because again, you, know, the, you have to put it aside regularly or else the temptation is we'll spend it. If we aren't doing it as these things happen, if we're not giving as God is prospering us, then the temptation is to say, well, it was a good year this year, but next year could be a bad year. You know, I gotta save this. I gotta protect myself. I've got to have this. Because, you know, yeah, sure, God gave me a lot this year, but who knows what's gonna happen next year. If we keep it all, what we're saying to God is, thank you very much, I don't trust you for a minute. Sure, you were good to me this year, but next year you turn on me. I gotta be ready. I gotta protect myself. Paul says, however God is prospering you, that's what you should set aside that week. In that moment, Paul says, as Christians, we want to give regularly. We want to give proportionally. And then look at this. I think what he's saying is we want to give wisely. We want to use wisdom. He says, when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable for me to go also, they will accompany me. These guys are going to raise all this money, and what are they going to do with it? They're not just going to hand it to some people. They're not even just going to hand it to some people and say, take it to Jerusalem. They're going to approve. It's a strong word. It means it comes from metallurgy. It means to test and to try and to make sure this is pure. They're going to approve some men. They're going to find some guys in that congregation that they have total confidence in. However much money they give them, that much money is going to arrive in Jerusalem. They can be totally trusted. They're going to be wise about who they entrust this money to. And then when those guys get to Jerusalem, they're not just going to turn it over to whomever. Oh, I'm from the church in Jerusalem. Famine relief? <laughs> I'll take care of that for you. Just give it to me. Paul is going to give them letters of introduction so they meet the right people. Because nobody in Jerusalem knows these guys from Corinth. Right? But everybody knows who Paul is. He has been in Jerusalem a dozen times. Right? How are they going to get in to see James, the brother of Jesus, right, who is in charge of famine relief? Now, I, I don't know if that's true. I'm just saying someone important. Right? How are these guys who show up from Corinth going to get in and get an audience with the guy, in, in Jesus' own brother, the guy in charge of all the famine relief? They got letters. Got a letter from Paul saying, hey, you need to talk to these guys. Right? Paul may go with them. Like, Not only are they going to choose good men that they can trust, who are then going to have letters to make sure they give it to the right people, there may be some outside accountability as well. Paul may decide, you know what? I'm going to go with you. It's not Paul's money. I mean, he, it's not, he neither gave it nor is he going to receive it. I bet he's going to know how much they entrusted to these guys and how much these guys gave to James or whomever when they get there. Like there's going to be outside accountability. They give regularly, they give proportionally, and I think Paul also says you need to give wisely. You should think about how you are giving. You 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 should be intelligent. You should be thoughtful. Please understand. I am not saying don't be generous. Oh my gosh, I was a missionary, okay? I lived on generosity. I am not saying don't be generous. If you feel like you're driving down the road and there's some guy standing on the side with a sign and you think the Holy Spirit says to you, hey, give that guy money, give him money. That if the Lord says to you to support something, to do something, absolutely do it. But also be wise, be prayerful, be thoughtful. 
They're going to test and approve the guys who take this. Paul's gonna give them letters of introduction, make sure they see the right people. Paul may go with them just to be sure everything is on the up and up. They are going to be careful about how they give this money. Paul says, give regularly, give proportionally, and give wisely. And as I said, he's not done. Look at what, just, just keep reading on in verse five. After I go through Macedonia, I'll come to you, for I will be going through Macedonia. Perhaps I'll stay with you for a while, or even spend the winter, so that you can help me on my journey wherever I go. Paul doesn't work for a living. He's a missionary. He is supported. What he's saying to them is, I'm going to take off. He, he founded Corinth on his second missionary journey. He's finished and gone back to Ephesus. He says, I'm going to wait in Ephesus until Pentecost. There's ministry to do here. But then he's going to go on his third missionary journey. So first missionary journey, he went to modern day Turkey. That's the province of Asia he's talking about. Second journey, he went through, Tur he went through modern day Turkey and then on into Greece. Do you know how he paid for staying in Greece? The churches in Turkey sent him money. Like you can read that in Acts. The churches that he planted on his first journey, they sent him money so he could plant new churches in Greece. And on his third journey, he's gonna go through Turkey, through Greece, and he's going, gonna go in the Caucasus. He's gonna go into modern day Albania and Croatia. <laughs> and he's gonna stop in Corinth on the way so that they can put him up for the winter and they can support him when he goes on to plant those churches. Because... They have a church because of the generosity of their brothers and sisters elsewhere. And they know that. I mean, it's clear in Acts. People are coming to Paul in Corinth and bringing him money from these churches. People know. He even says that in 2 Corinthians. I never took a dime from you, he says. All my needs were supported from these earlier churches. And Paul expects them to do the same thing. They owe those former churches. They have a church because other people supported him. And he says, I plan on staying with you on my way to the next place I'm going to go. And you can put me up and you can support me as I go on. He says, I don't even know where I'm going yet. So, you know, maybe you're paying for a plane ticket next door. Maybe you're paying for a plane ticket to England. We haven't figured that out yet. But Paul expects them to be part of that ministry. Look what he says near the end. Look on down to verse 17. I was glad when Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaius arrived because they have supplied what was lacking from you. They brought Paul money. They brought him a letter, they brought him news, and they brought Paul money because he's in Ephesus being a pastor. Again, he's not working in a trade. He's working in the church. And they're sending Paul money. When I was a missionary and you sent me money, because many of you did, do you remember what I said to you? I said, thank you. <laughs> That's really generous. I so appreciate that. Thank you so much, right? What does Paul say when they send him money? They have made up what you were lacking. Literally, what Paul says is, they have made up, and we still have that expression in English, right? I'll, I'll make it up to you. Right? I owe you something. I'll make it up to you. They have made up your poverty. Paul says you weren't giving before, so you were poor. Now you have decided to give. You have decided to support what God is doing. In this case, it's here in Ephesus. Later, he wants it to be elsewhere in the world as he plants churches. You used to be poor, Paul says, because you weren't giving. Now, now you are giving. You're not poor anymore. Wow, is that upside down from the way we think? We think if I give it away, then I'm poor because I've lost it. And Paul thinks you are poor when you don't give it away. And Paul thinks that they owed it. Again, giving is a command in scripture if you are a follower of Jesus. Now the who, why, where, what, all that stuff, that is voluntary. That's on you. Paul says, give regularly, give proportionally, give wisely. But then he goes on and tells these guys, hey, you owe me. And you owe, you owe the churches back there who supported me. And you owe the churches out there that haven't been planning left. You need to pay it forward. The ministry of God is advancing. It's going to come through your town and keep right on going. And you need to be a part of that. Like, 
Can you imagine? I go to the I go to the back and shake people's hands and say hi at the end of the uh, at the end of the service. Can you imagine if I stood by the offering box and as you drop things in, I'm like, about time. <laughs> Glad to see you're finally making it up to me. Like, I would never say these sorts of things to you. Wow, Paul. I mean, Paul's hardcore. He's got no trouble saying this because it's true. If you are a follower of Christ then giving is not optional. It is absolutely commanded all throughout scripture. Now who you give it to, when you give it, where you give it, that is up to you. Again, Paul gives us, here's how you do it, but it's not, you will give 10% to this church, you will give 15% to me, you will save this much. There's no numbers, there's no time frame in the sense of you must give at this date or you must give. He's like, look, every week, just set something aside. I don't know when we're gonna send this down to Jerusalem. So just every week, set something aside. Be regular, be proportional, be wise. So I have been telling you for weeks, right, for months, for years, for two years, we've been talking about paying off this building. And I have been saying, I think this is the next right thing to do. But we are also trying to follow what Paul says. Because, you know, I kind of read ahead as I was getting ready for this last year. So I'm not saying to you, you have to give. Do you remember what I have been saying to you? I am praying that God will prosper you. I am praying that God will prosper you financially. And when he does, please remember, I think the next right thing for us to do is pay off this building. We give the bank a ton of money every month, but only half of it goes to pay off our debt. The other half goes to the bank for the privilege of owing them this money. And I think we need to stop giving the bank twice as much money as we owe them. We need to pay it off and use that money in ministry. Okay? And I'm trying to say it the way Paul says it. We absolutely need to pay off this building. How much you give, though, that's between you and God. When you give it, how you give it, I can't tell you that. I can just tell you we are absolutely supposed to give. And I want to add one more thing that's in this passage. Look at verse 12. Now about our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to go to you with the brothers. He was quite unwilling to go now, but he will go when he has the opportunity. You are not accountable to me. Apollos was not accountable to Paul. Paul told Apollos, Apollos wasn't a church planner. He was a church strengthener. He would come into churches and he, would, he was apparently a great teacher and a great debater. Like when, when there were people arguing with the church, apparently he was just, just decimated people who tried to argue against the church. He taught people and strengthened them. And Paul's like, you need to go to Corinth. Those people are in trouble. I mean, look at everything we've seen in this book. You need to go to Corinth. And Apollos said, no. No, I'm not going to do that now. That's not what I'm doing. You are not accountable to me. I am telling you, I think God wants us to pay this building off. You will never stand before me and give me an account for what you did with money. But you will absolutely stand before God and give him an account of what you did with money. And folks, if I can just step to the side and put my missionary jacket back on, right? We are the richest people on the planet. We have more money than Croesus. Is there anyone in this room that wonders if they will eat today? Because I'm telling you, in Africa and Asia, many of your brothers and sisters don't know if they will eat today. And I'm willing to bet that for the last year, in all of 2021, I am willing to bet there has never been a day when you said, Lord, if you don't send me food, I'm not going to eat. But I can tell you, your brothers and sisters all over the world pray that all the time. We are so rich. And if you don't feel rich, then you probably should look at what you're spending your money on. Now, I get it. This is an expensive place to live. It is way more expensive for us to live in America than it was to live in Africa. But we are so wealthy. We have been given so much wealth. And Jesus says, to him who's been given much, much is expected. You are never going to stand before me and give an account for a dime. You are absolutely going to stand before the Lord Jesus and give an account for every dime. 
and you have to decide. It's voluntary. It's up to you. You have to decide. You have to talk to God. You have to say to the Lord, this is what you've given me. This is how you've blessed me. In Paul's words, this is how you have prospered me. What do you want me to do with it? Because it's yours. It's all yours. Every scrap we have comes from God. Every wavelength of light, every photon, every bit of energy, it all comes from Jesus. It's all his good gifts to us. And folks, so often we take those and we say, thank you very much. And off we go. You are not accountable to me. Apollos was not accountable to Paul. You are accountable to the Lord. You have to stand before him one day and give an account for how you lived your life, how you spent what he gave you. Hey, he didn't give you skills in this area and this area and this area, but he has made us the wealthiest society ever in the history of the world. If, 10 pers- if evangelicals, okay, sorry, I'm on a roll. Just evangelicals, okay, not Christians, evangelicals, people who say they believe the Bible, they believe in salvation by Jesus alone. If evangelicals gave 10% of their wealth away, it pays for every church in the world. It pays for every missions agency in the world. It pays for every aid agency in the world. And it gets the U.S. out of debt in about 20 years. The amount of wealth in America is astounding 10% of our wealth is an incredible amount of money. Folks, God gave 10% to subsistence level farmers, to people who would die if the rains didn't come. And we think that's such a burden. Oh my gosh, 10%. Brothers and sisters, you are not accountable to me. You can listen to everything I say and be like, wow, somebody needs to give that guy a chill pill but you will answer to Jesus for what you have done with your wealth because you have it. You have it in spades. So I'm gonna pray for us. I'm gonna ask God to speak to us. I'm gonna ask his spirit to talk to each of us because you must give. But where? It's between you and God. How much? It's between you and God. When you give it, it's between you and God. It's not prescribed. The only thing that is prescribed is you must give. You must give to the Lord's work. The rest is up to you. So I'm going to pray the Spirit will speak to you. You will know what the rest is. You will know what the Lord wants of you, what he desires of you. So let's pray. Uh, Jesus, I am sorry. I mean, I, I, I know the greed in my own heart. I know the greed that all of us share. I know how money and possessions and materialism just gnaw at us. I feel it. I know my brothers and sisters feel it. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us that, that, that we are selfish. That I want to spend everything you give me on me. I want to take all of your good gifts and say thank you very much. And walk off. And wow, Paul barely even seems to be saying thank you. (laughs) Lord, we want to be faithful, but you know, you know what our world is like. You you know how we are bombarded every day with messages that we need to take care of ourselves and we need to spend everything on ourselves and that if we don't do it, no one will. And I'm so sorry we don't trust you to take care of us. I'm so sorry we don't trust you to provide for us. Jesus Be gracious to us, speak to us, speak to me, speak to my brothers and sisters. How do you want us to use what you have given us? In the case of what Paul's talking about here, how do you want us to use our wealth? Paul's talking to subsistence farmers and telling them they must give. You gave the tithe to people who would starve to death if the rains didn't come. And yet you told them to give 10% to you first. Lord, forgive us, speak to us, show us. How, how do you want each of us to use what you have given us to further your kingdom? And thank you, Lord, that no one is accountable to me. Thank you that they are only accountable to you. No one has to justify anything they do to me. 
But Jesus, I pray you would speak to us. That you would tell us, are you pleased with how we are spending our money? Are you pleased with our priorities? Are you pleased with the way that, that we are living out that we trust you and we depend on you and we believe that you will take care of us, not our retirement funds, not our investments, not our great businesses, although we are grateful for all those things. We believe you will provide for us. Oh, Jesus, speak to us as we take communion, as we sing this song. Lord, remind us that you can be trusted, that we don't have to cling to everything we don't have to provide for ourselves. You are our good God. We pray all these things in your name, Jesus, because we pray everything in your name. Amen. Now, again, let's close. One of the reasons we don't talk about money every week is because we know that in our culture, that's one of the charges leveled against the church. All you care about is money. So we don't want anybody coming in here and come in a few weeks and thinking, wow, what's the thing that happens every single week? Oh, they ask for money. The music's different, the sermon's different, the leaders are different, the preacher's different. The thing that's the same every time is they ask for money. The thing we do that's the same every time is this. We remind ourselves that this is all about Jesus. The only reason we, our hearts beat is because of Jesus. The only reason we are able to give is because Jesus prospers us. The only reason we sit together is because of Jesus. So I'm gonna pray over us again. And then when I'm done, just get up, go get the elements. There's stations at either end. Remember, there's gluten-free here in the middle. If you need that on your right-hand side, go get the bread, the cup, bring it back to your seat, and then I'll lead us as we take it all together. So let me pray over the elements. Thank you, Jesus. We say that every time here. Thank you. You gave so much more. You are not asking me to give up my life, to take on the sins of the world, to be crucified, to die, to be buried, and to descend into hell. You're not asking me to do any of that. You did that for us. As Paul says, you, though you were rich, you became poor for us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. We remind ourselves again this week, as we remind ourselves every week, that you died for us. We are so, so grateful. Remind us again now, Jesus, as we nourish ourselves on the cup and on the bread. Remind us again, Lord. We ask this in your name. Amen. Stand with me if you can. What I receive from the Lord is what I pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Church, as you take the bread, remember, he who was rich, rich beyond measure, became poor unto death for us. Let's take the bread. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Church, as we take the cup, remember, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Let's take the cup. For whenever you eat this bread, whenever you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. If you'll put that cup on your left-hand side, there's a little holder there in the back of your chair. We will come by and clean them up after. And while you're doing that, pray with me one more time. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you shed your blood for us. Thank you that your body was broken for us. Thank you that you took our sin. You did not have to. You could have been just. Thank you that your justice was tempered by mercy. Thank you for what the psalmist says. Your throne rests on justice. Your throne rests on faithfulness. But what flows from your throne is mercy. You sit on justice, but you do not deal with us in justice. If justice flowed from your throne, it would drown us. What flows from your throne is mercy and grace. Thank you. 
Oh, we're so grateful, Lord. Thank you. We do not deserve it. Accept our worship now as we sing again. We are your grateful people. We pray all this in your name, Jesus. We pray everything in your name. You are our God, and we are yours. Amen. Separated, the bridge was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you had me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide. Left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross, you paid the debt I owed. Broke my chains, freed my soul. For the first time, I had hope. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus, it has won. my place laid inside my tomb of sin you were buried for three days but then you walked right out again and now death has no sleep and life has no way for I have been transformed by the blood
Thank you, Lord. Um, God, I pray that as we remember that you have paid the price to save us, God, I pray that we would remember going into our lives to give generously, God, that we would pursue Christ in everything we do. Lord, um, as we are sent out today, I pray that we would carry that, that command, God, and those words, and that you would give us discernment on, on how, to, how to go about that, Lord. I thank you so much for bringing us here today. I thank you for, again, God, just your sacrifice and the blood that has paid the price for our sins. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Dunwoody Community Church, you are sent.